Welcome to a virtual version of the Lord's Day service for August 18, 2024. I'll start by reading some scripture from uh, 1 Kings. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father, David. Only he sacrificed and offered incense at the high places. When the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the principal high place, Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night and said, Ask what, you, what I should give you. Solomon said, you, shall ha you have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart toward you, and you have kept for him this great and steadfast love, and I have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, although I am only a little child. I do not know how to go in or go out or come in. Your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, uh, able to discern between good and evil, for who can govern this your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this, God said to him, because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or for the life of your enemies, but you have asked for yourself to understand what and discern what is right. I now do according to your word, and indeed I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you and no one shall arise after you. And then our next reading is from Hebrews, and this is the um, uh, fifth in a series of six sermons on Hebrews. So uh, we're talking about Hebrews 11 here, starting with the first verse. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, and I'm only going to read little excerpts of Hebrews 11 because it's quite long. Starting at verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Indeed, by faith our ancestors received approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. By faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. By faith, Enoch was taken so that he did not experience death. By faith, Noah warned by God about um, events as yet unseen. By faith, Abraham obeyed and he set out not knowing where he was going. By faith, with Sarah received a power of pro procreation, even though she was too old. By faith, Abraham, when put to the test, offered up Isaac. By faith, Isaac invoked blessings for the future on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, mentioned uh, of the exodus of the Israelites. By faith, Moses kept the... Passover and the sprinkling of blood. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as if it were on dry land. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish because she had received the spies in peace. And what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I Tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin of that clings to us so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, 
looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, who for the sake of the joy of, of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, Solomon kept the faith while his father, David, ruled. Solomon was Bathsheba's son, and David had already had a wife when he assaulted Bathsheba. You, you all know that story. David would later collect at least six more wives and many, many sons. There was a massive amount of palace intrigue and infighting as David grew feeble. The sons were licking their chops as David's life slipped away. Now, Bathsheba, you know, who was the focus of David's shame, still, she came to David and begged for her son Solomon to be king over all of the others. Now, David would endorse Solomon, and but the king's blessing... Even David's blessing would mean nothing if Solomon could not overcome his rivals. In the end, Solomon's service and faithfulness to David paid off, and the Lord would recognize him for it. In a dream, the Lord told uh, Solomon to ask for what he wanted as king. Instead of asking for long life, wealth, or victory, Solomon asked for wisdom and discernment. And this pleased the Lord. And in time, Solomon would be blessed with all these other things as well. But none of this was certain. None of it seemed likely. And the transition from David to Solomon would be mostly peaceful, actually, but filled with intrigue and it was not at all inevitable, and it was fraught with danger. It was a time of great anxiety, any transition like this is. And it would take all the faith and wisdom that Solomon could muster to make it possible. One of the greatest fallacies of er any generation is to look to its past and think that history must have been inevitable. The things that happened, it, they only make sense. It must be inevitable, right? Now, the biblical author, authors often give us this feeling. But even in our own time, we know that this isn't true. Hist the historian John Meacham often speaks about this in his books about American history. Confusion and uncertainty accompany every generation. Every generation looks to its future only dimly. Each generation is astounded at the twists and turns of their futures as much as we are about our future. Our future is uncertain and unclear as ever. Like Solomon, it will take all of the faith and wisdom that we can muster to faithfully step out into our future. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Indeed, by faith, our ancestors received approval. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. And this opens uh, Hebrews 11. And it's the great line, probably, of the whole book of Hebrews. And as you can see in these words, there's no mincing of words at all. There's no false assurances. There's no Pollyanna about blind optimism, you know, or the promise that everything's going to be great. No, there's simply faith. And it's the cloud of faithful witnesses that we hear about that who, despite their struggles, still had faith in God. Just like them, we can't know our future. God just doesn't work that way. Sometimes we're desperate, we desperately want God to control everything, 
in spite of the fact that we also want free will, we want everything to be made easy. We want the path laid out before us. And you've heard me often speak about John Calvin, you know, uh, who is the single most influential person in the formation of the Presbyterian Church. But my criticism was never really about John Calvin, the man from 500 years ago. No, my criticism has always been about those who use him to grasp for certainty. It's just human nature for us to grasp for that future, to choose sides, to make sure that God is in absolute control. But all of these impulses for our desire for grasping for control for a certain future works against the cloud of witnesses. It works against the very foundation of our faith. Instead of control, grasping for certainty, we are given the cloud of witnesses who had faith. That's what God gives us. That's all. This is why Hebrews 11 is so important. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. That means that our assurance is not based in certainty. Our conviction does not come from things that we see. It's important not to confuse faith with the foolishness and ignoring evidence by any means. So that's why today's lectionary passage about the wisdom of Solomon fits so well with Hebrews 11, because faith and wisdom go together. They aren't separate. They're not in spite of each other. They go together. Like other political figures, the assessment of Solomon goes up and down with history. Sometimes he's a popular figure, other times not. Oddly, the most powerful king in Israel's history, who Solomon was, doesn't even get a mention in the cloud of witnesses in, in, um, in Hebrews. I mean, he mentions Enoch. I mean, who is he? Why not Sol- Solomon? I mean, really? Come on. So it seems that Solomon's reputation may have been at a low ebb in the, uh, in the first and second century uh, when Hebrews was written and being circulated. Now, Solomon did become selfish, domineering, and autocratic during his reign. But so did David. So it's odd how Solomon's act of humility in asking for wisdom instead of security, wealth, and power was not a greater part of his legacy. Faith must always be coupled with wisdom. Now, Ephesians is a very sensible letter, and we'll also read a passage, a short passage from Ephesians 5 uh, before this sermon. And Ephesians is a favorite because it just seems so practical. Hebrews is confusing and mystical and high-minded, and Ephesians just seems like good, solid Christian advice. As we can see in next week's sermon, when I'll talk much more about Ephesians 6, there's more to it than than it seems, actually. Ephesians uses lots of pagan imagery and language in a very sophisticated way. But it is, it's still, it's an important and uh, very uh, practical book, and it's right to think of Ephesians in this way. Because in these verses, it says, don't be foolish. Don't get drunk, it says. Instead, your merrymaking should be with God, giving thanks to God. And you should do everything in the name of Jesus. Now, sometimes this has been taken wrong. It's not a call for listening only to contemporary Christian music, for example. It's not saying, you know, secular things are bad. 
It's not about purity balls or high necklines or long skirts, as some people have said. It's not about separating from the world at all. It's about wisdom and savvy. It's about faith being informed by wisdom, soberness and sound foundation in reason. It's about being steady in the faith. To the long list of faithful witnesses in chapter 11 of Hebrews, I added the first two verses of um, chapter 12, which I just read, because it gives us the reason for the list. Because it says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. In this statement, Hebrews comes down to earth, like we saw in Ephesians. Instead of being obsessed with our burdens and sins, it says, it says we should just get up and go and run the race, persevere. Now, you've heard me talk a lot about the election in recent weeks and the great sense of fear that we have in our country. You know, fear of immigrants, fear of economics, fear of autocracy, fear of losing what makes America great and unique. The thing that both re that Republicans and Democrats and independents have in common is this one thing, and that is fear of what the future will bring. The thing that uh, there and there is a great cloud of witnesses from the past that can give us hope. God has been in these lands before, and God will remain always. Not in certainty, not in fighting for us in our battles, and not locking down the future. Last month, I asked our session to think ahead to November. What are we going to do? Regardless of the outcome, there will be many fearful people, however the elections go. There, will there really be mass deportations, as we saw in the signs that were gleefully waved at the Republican National Convention? If that's true, if there are, or at least even, even the threat of mass deportations... What are we going to do to protect our neighbors? Will there be a decline in faithfulness and America's greatness, as many people also worry about? They think it's happening right before our eyes. What will we say? If that's true, are we prepared to show everyone that God truly is in our midst and that we should trust in God? and where God is taking us. As a pastor, I pray that God will bless me with the wisdom to navigate these fraught times with you. That people will rise to action, but not to violence. That we can be a place of calm and wisdom in our church. That we will speak words of faith and wisdom. Jesus is the perfecter of our faith. And that is this uh, word, tele, teleoten, which is perfecter, completer, fulfiller of our faith. And you might ask, well, how is Jesus, how does he do this? How is he the perfecter of faith? He does it by endurance. Endurance of the cross, disregarding the shame of the cross, for the sake of joy. Now, this isn't just any idle joy. No, this is joy in the mess, in the messiness of life. Joy in the uncertainty of life. Joy in facing death and shame. Joy in saying that it will, that these things will not determine our future. Pray that we will have the wisdom, the discernment, 
and the faith to face the future with joy as well. Let us pray. God of perfecting and of completing, you have placed us in a troubled and uncertain time, and we ask why. We think it's not fair. We want certainty, but instead you just give us faith. You give us the cloud of witnesses, and you give us wisdom if we ask for it. Let us choose wisdom over certainty. Let us choose it over power and over riches. Let us be faithful in wisdom. In the name of our perfecter, the perfecter of our faith, Jesus the Christ. Amen.